Hi, good morning. It's Francis Hunt, the Market Sniper, and I'm extremely fortunate to have a very special guest with me on our, our show today. Um, it is Dr. John Demartini, uh, author of 40 books, the founder of the Demartini Method. Um, John has been on Larry King Live. Uh, he travels the world continually. He is the, known as the human behavioral specialist, um, a special topic being ax axiology, uh, that of values. Good morning, John. How are you? Good morning. Glad to have you here. John, we're a trading channel, but before I uh, get too hip into any of the heavy things, I've found that many people that want to come into the world of trading and are taking a change in career, potentially it's because they want to leave where they are at and they think there might be something a little easier for them on the other side. In terms of values, what's your take on that kind of um, career second thought moment? Well, every individual lives by a set of priorities a set of values in their life. And whenever they're doing something that is aligned and congruent with their highest value, and they have deep meaning and fulfillment doing it, they're more objective in their reason, and they don't tend to search for an immediate gratification and try to avoid pain. But when they're living by lower values or they're unfulfilled in their life, which is very commonly what occurs when people want to transition from one job to another, the associated pain that they're perceiving and what they're doing that's not meaningful makes them vulnerable to look and with a subjective bias and confirmation bias to exaggerate the pleasures about this new endeavor. And so that even catapults them into this new endeavor blindly and then they end up resenting their old and they want to get out of it quick and so they're impulsive. And so in the process of doing it, they eventually get infatuated with this new ideal that they're going to meet and they get vulnerable. And that blindness sometimes makes them less objective and less reasonable in their actions. And they sometimes imagine that things are going to happen overnight. And immediate gratification usually costs people uh, great fortunes instead of long-term planning and vision, which is the executive center in the brain, which is when you live by your highest values, you activate. And there you have a vision, you strategically plan, you patiently execute, you have self-governance, and you achieve. So it's very important to make sure you have objective uh, data and reason uh, when you go into the next endeavor and plan. Very, very valuable insight. What would you say then to someone who's maybe con contemplating and thinks he has an interest, thinks he, his values could be aligned to this new activity, but rather than emotionally responding and potentially building that fantasy that you mentioned, um, what kind of process should he do to before just leaping, the look before you leap moment? Well, I tell people to take the job position that they're in now and to sit down and write down how specifically is this job position that you have now going to help you in this transition? Because if you resent it, you're going to want to impulsively get out of it. But if you can see how whatever it is, is a stepping stone and is providing you possibly some income to make a transition smoothly without impulse. And then by having the benefits, it calms down that urgency. In the process of doing that, it's also wise to find someone who's mentored. They can mentor you in that area so you're not blind with fantasies. So you have somebody that gives you some objective data and give you some, uh, some feedback about what real th things you're going to face. It's good to plan it out and to think about what you're going to do, what type of real returns you're going to get, what type of action, how long is it going to take to learn it, what, uh, what's real. So going out and finding out and educating yourself and finding out and getting proper mentorship in that new area and linking what you're doing now to that so you can see that it wasn't a mistake, it's just a transitionary uh, position allows you to make a more objective um, outcome. Because some people go out there and think that's a greener pasture over there, like in relationships, and then find out after their blind fantasy that they've had a nightmare. It's the fatal attraction, I call it. And with the fatal attraction comes Glenn Close and Michael Douglas event. <laughs> Excellent, yes indeed. Um, so almost they should seek out someone that highlights some of the negatives with this future uh, course as well, and presents it in a more balanced sense um, so that they absolutely not run no risk of creating a, this mental halo. Well, I, this is what I, I use sometimes in my presentations as a, as a kind of a metaphor. I said, imagine somebody trying to sell you on an idea that is all upside, no downside. <laughs> and then imagine if Warren Buffett was being exposed to the same idea, what do you think he would do with it? And in all probability, Warren would just uh, walk away and say, thank you very much and walk away. Because he would know anybody who has any serious understanding of economics knows 
with every risk, there's a reward and reward, there's a risk. There's always a pair of opposites. So to expect yourself to get advantages without disadvantages and challenges, either psychological uh, challenges of having to face yourself and your own emotions, or challenges in the, all the variables in this so-called random market. Um, it's unrealistic to go in there and think you're going to get all pleasures and no pains and all ease without difficulty. You've got a learning curve to do. And the more knowledge you have and the more mentorship you have, the higher the probability that the market works in a way where you can take advantage of it. It's about educating yourself. Um, they said it takes 10,000 hours to, to master an art or some field. I think it's actually more than that, but um, at least 10,000 hours. So I would practice and practice and practice and practice before you go in the real thing because you can wound yourself with easy money getting quick rich yeah. or losing money. You can wound yourself and sidetrack yourself because if you get really uh, a good return in a very short period of time, that can actually uh, make you not appreciate the methodical application of the tools. And if you get uh, a loss over a large period of time, they can never want to touch it again. So it's wiser to take it in increments and educate yourself and do it and, and, and earn the right to risk and play the game properly. Love that, earning the right to risk. In fact, one of the first things I notice is that sense of impatience. Many people say, well, I, I can straight away release the job and the income. And I get distinctly nervous when they say that because they're placing an immediate financial pressure on something that is actually a learning process in an initial instance. Well, what happens is fear is our friend. Almost everywhere you go, people say you need to get rid of fear, conquer fear, get over fear, get rid of fear, stay away from fear and all this stuff. Fear's your friend. Fear lets you know when you're basically setting up a fantasy. In, in ancient Greece, there's a thing that they call the phobia and the philia. The phobia is something you want to walk away from and the philia is something you want to have. Anytime you exaggerate the philia, you accentuate the phobia. So if you're having an anxiety and a fear about going from one place to the other, you probably have a fantasy and you don't have your strategic plan in place. You probably have a fantasy about the outcome that's all pleasure without pain. And you're, you're, that's a, that fear is your friend. It's letting you know that you need more diligence in your planning, more education in a system, and making sure you know what you're doing before you make the leap. And it's basically you're, you're trying to avoid a pain like an animal. So we have an animal brain that's as a, the amygdala area of the brain that's wanting to avoid predator and seek prey want to avoid fear and to seek greed. Yes. And uh, that part usually doesn't wisely invest. That's, that's the speculator, not the investor. But the person that actually has objective reasoning and see how what's happening is on the way, not in the way, they're more logical, they're more methodical, and they follow a strategy. So if you follow a strategy, you make wealth. Uh, follow an impulse, it usually catches you. Correct. We, I almost call the emotional the lowest common denominator of your reactions and invariably the most painful one. That was a fabulous uh, response. Assuming someone's gone through all the, the grounding and alignment and they feel now this is the thing, one of the features of trading is that it's, it's very exciting and it stimulates adrenal endorphin uh, type responses and it can create sudden compulsive behavior where you almost vortex in. How can that people prevent this tendency, particularly in the early part of their trading career? Well, I've had the, the blessing of working with quite a few traders over the years. And there was one that worked in the options uh, pit there in Chicago, the options trading. And uh, we made it where any time he earned a certain percentage on a trade that was over and above a certain amount, that we had a procedure that he would call me, even if it was for five minutes, and when he go through a checklist, and the checklist meant that a certain portion of that we would take off the table when we would put in conservative investments and then we'd allow ourselves to trade just a little bit more. So we just put a, a stable a component underneath that vol volatile component. And uh, if we had a loss, he would call us and we would calm down those states. We'd always neutralize the emotions because emotions get you in trouble. As Warren Buffett says, until you can manage your emotions, don't expect to manage money. So if you have extreme emotions, you're, you're, you're very likely to do foolish things. But if you're objective and stick to a strategy and you've already planned the strategy, foresight is wiser than hindsight. So if you go into a trade having a foresight, knowing all the different variables, knowing what you're going to do, if it goes this way or this way, having it planned out, you're more likely to move forward and make money in the, in the market than if you just go in there impulsively think you're going to shoot from the hip. That's a fabulous response. You're almost taking me naturally to all the next questions because one of the, the, the YouTubes I released was 
um, how I made a certain sizable sum in a very short time, and it was one of the worst things for my trading uh, course. In that, so we actually need to manage for overperformance as well as underperformance. So it seems like the extremes can bite you, John, and it's all about balance and symmetry. Is, that, is there something in that? Yeah, uh, pardon me for going off on a little bit of a, a tangent here. Many years ago, I had a gentleman who, who came to me um, at the program I do called The Breakthrough Experience. And in this program, as you know, I help people break through whatever they feel is in the way of what they want to go after. It helps them get clear about what they want, and it looks at what it is that's interfering with that, and then how do we get through it. And he was having challenges with his relationship that he'd been married for 10 years, and it was just a sort of blah relationship, he felt. It wasn't exciting. And I said, well, what are you comparing it to? He said, well, this chick I met uh, 11 years ago that I met at Club Med and we met and we had three days and it was just unbelievable passion and sexuality and this and that. And I said, well, as long as you're comparing your wife to a fantasy, there's no way she can win. Because a fantasy, almost anybody can endure three days of fantasy, but nobody could sustain that. So what were the drawbacks of that fantasy girl? And he goes, man, there was no drawbacks. I said, yes, there's always a drawback. So what were the drawbacks? And after probing further, he started finding them. He said, well, there was her voice was a little whiny and I wouldn't want to be seen with her in public. And, and it, we, we found out, we have, as we accumulated the drawbacks of that fantasy from 10 years earlier, 11 years earlier, he started to open his heart to his wife because he couldn't appreciate his wife because he's comparing it to this high. Now that goes forward and backward in time. So if you have a situation where you make a fortune and it looks, wow, I killed the market. The, the first foolish thing to do is to think you did it, <laughs> that your genius did that, instead of the market happened to go in your favor. Sometimes you think, oh, I'm just a genius, and you think, oh, I'm going to do that again and again and again. Ego. Your ego gets in the way. Then what happens is you, you get a high, and then anything less than those amounts, they don't feel like they're anything anymore, so they're not enough. So you're always looking for that big high and looking for that big kill. As Jim Collins says in his business management, it's the little incremental tweakings on a business that makes a great business, not this big one thing that kills it. So actually making money very quickly can actually undermine the strategy that it takes to build wealth. So it's wise to, to moderate. It was um, the guy that ran um, Southwest Airlines. He didn't allow his company to go too fast in growth or too far in decay. He maintained an up and down system with kind of a, you know, a gain and loss limits. And as a result of it, he had a nice steady growth in Southwest Airlines, where a lot of people would go over, overboard and then have to lay people off, and then they'd have to hire people and they have to lay people off. They didn't allow themselves governance. People that have governance and don't allow themselves to get too extreme in emotion are the people that have strategies that fulfill economics. So, yeah, you can get a, a windfall for a day. The wisest thing to do is to ask yourself, so what's the downside of that? And when I was in practice years ago, in practice, I, um, whenever I'd have a big day and I'd start to think I'm really amazing, I would ask, so who did I forget to, to say their name? What uh, staff member did I forget to thank? What procedure did I overlook? What paperwork did I not do? I had a checklist of things to come calm me down because when I was calm and centered, I was more focused on the purpose of my organization instead of me, I, my, how great I was. And then if I had a really low day, I asked, what did I do? Who did I remember? What did I procedure as you follow? I had my own checklist of questions that I checked off every day to make sure I was centered and purposeful on a daily basis. And the volatilities in my business stabilized and I had the steady growth where beforehand I was up and down and up and down and highly volatile. And just like high volatilities in, in the small cap companies, high volatility is the small of a si small company. And large cap companies are usually more stable. So the more you stabilize yourself, the bigger your capitalization. It's incredible, because our strategy is actually based on volatility, and we're interested at that low moment of volatility on the basis of return. Well, it's not about the, mar the market volatility can work in your favor, but yeah. you have to be able to override that market. You can't let the market run you. You have to be able to override the market's fluctuation. Yes, so the extremes are definitely damaging. That's really, that's really interesting. So if someone gets caught in a habit, because I find this certain traders may continue to repeat a certain mistake, and I find I can be quite helpless in how to pull them out of it. In other words, for example, say they trade too large, and they continue to blow massive holes in their account when they get it wrong. Um, or they're taking profits too early. These are typical um, areas, failing to stick to process. Um, and, and it's a repetitive behavior. So sometimes people get caught in a loop. What can we do? How do we develop that self-awareness and, and, and how do we snap out of it where you get that 
I've got to do something different feeling. And well, as I said a moment ago, that, that when, because people have a set of priorities and set of values, when you live by your highest value, your foresight, your forebrain, your telencephalon, your medial prefrontal cortex, your executive center comes online. And that has self-governance, and that makes you think before you react. But if you live by lower values, you tend to react before you think and you'll impulsively do something based on assumed pleasures and pains and biases. So the more you can actually have a higher value on wealth building, the higher the value on trading, if it's really valuable to you, so where you want to master it, you're less likely to be vulnerable to those impulses. So one of the things that I tell people to do is to uh, write down hundreds of reasons why you want to be a master trader. And I didn't say a, a quick at rich uh, you know, speculator a master trader. And if you have that as a goal and you look at everything that you learn about master trading, it's not impulse, it's strategy. So you have to write down the benefits of doing that and becoming a master trader and make sure it's really high in your value to do it because sometimes people, they're unfulfilled and they just create a fantasy, they think, oh, I want to do that, and then six weeks later they're off to something else. If you truly want to be a master trader, you're going to want to ma master the trades. I had a, a lady, a young girl that lived behind me when I was a teenager, 18 years old, I moved back from Hawaii to Texas. And there's a girl who was 16 that lived behind me. And she wanted to be a tennis pro. And she would ask me to come out and play with her on her, her backyard tennis, and because she had a tennis uh, thing there. And I said, uh, sure. So I played tennis with her every day. And I was interested in winning, so I would, I would beat her. But she was interested in mastering her tennis game. So she was pra using me as a dummy to practice procedures based on a pro guidance. And so the first two months or so, I was kind of winning. By the third month, I was not winning as much. And by the fourth month, I didn't want to play. <laughs> because she was winning every time, and I couldn't beat her because she kept focusing on mastering the, mar the art and the skills, and I just wanted to win. So I was looking for immediate gratification, and she was looking to master the skill. So mastering the skill will take you farther than just trying to get a quick get rich. That's a fabulous analogy. In fact, what we do is um, we, we, we talk about submitting to the process and not having monetary goals in the beginning. Because like you say, it's all about just the winning or getting to a big number. Establish the learning and uh, get the process. And you've, you've basically um, you've just fielded a fabulous analogy for why that, that's the long run. So by trading and playing the longer game and focusing on the process, you're more likely to have a sustained career and you're mastering your emotions uh, in that sense. And by repeating a particular error that is always bad, you're probably responding to some form of emotional response and you're subordinating your, the wealth, the, 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 the desire to make a professional career and wealth build out of your trading. Have I yeah. synthesized that correctly? I, I remember there on the, on the, I lived, or my office is on the 52nd floor of a building in Houston, my Houston office, and there was a trading, a forex trading, the entire floor was a forex trade just above it. And uh, so at lunch, uh, instead of me going and doing any trades, I asked if I could just come and watch them. So I used to just watch them for days at lunch, just watch them, watch them, watch them, watch them before I ever put any money in. I just watched them and watched them what they did. And I noticed that majority of the traders were young. Most of them were under 40s. And uh, so I, I was curious about that. Why is there no older traders? <laughs> I was very interested in that, why there was not any really older, mature uh, individuals in there. And um, because they were, they were very enthusiastic, these guys. But I noticed that the people that were mature and they were patient, you could see the, the, the volatilities of the emotions of the people that were newer at it and the people that had been sustained. They didn't, if the market went up or down, they didn't react. And they just kept doing the trades and kept, like you said, following this procedure. And they're the ones that made the money. And the older people, why they weren't on the trade is they were owning the, the companies. The older people were owning the trading companies and the, the, where the younger people were getting their lessons. So it's a, it's, a, it's a real thing about patience, perseverance, and strategy. That's fabulous. Something else we suggest doing and we encourage is that people have a savings and investments plan outside of their trading accounts because a lot of people think the trading will just supplant um, and they'll go straight to the leverage uh, and that'll be able to backfill all those pension savings they haven't made as they're making their way closer to retirement. Um, tell us your take on earning the right to leverage and uh, saving investment. You have touched on it a bit, bit more. Well, I, I think that uh I'm a perf perfect uh, example of cash. I keep a lot of cash. And people think, well, you know, you have way more cash than you need. 
Warren Buffett keeps $60 billion in cash fluctuating. Um, Bill Gates keeps a year's worth of liquid capital for his entire company. Um, I think you see Apple has got about $160 billion in cash. I wonder why they have so much cash. I have a feeling it's because they know that it's wise to not have emotions. And having a stable ba bank of cash, a stable base of liquid cash, allows you to, to you might say, mitigate any volatilities that come. I, I have a 10% rule that I wrote about in Jet Set Magazine, because that's one of the magazines I write for. And uh, I was told when I was about 20 by a guy named Ed Tellison, he said, you're not a millionaire until you can gain and lose a million without blinking an eye. I didn't really understand what he was talking about at the time, because I thought a millionaire had a million dollars net, net worth. But now I understand, because I've had fluctuations of a million dollars before. And so uh, I know what it's like to not have any fluctuation with a million dollars today. But at one time, that would have devastated me. If I was to go up or down a million dollars, I'd be emotional. So in t I call it the 10% rule. 10 times the amount of volatility, if you have that amount in, in liquid or in total net worth, you don't react but anything more than that. So if you have a million dollars on the market and all of a sudden it goes to a million one hundred thousand, yeah, you don't get elated, you don't get, you know, you don't get too proud, you don't get extroverted and say, hey, how's your market doing? How's your business doing? How's your trading doing? And if you go down to 900,000, you don't get re too reactive. But if it drops to 600,000, you, you're gonna wanna sell. And if it goes to 1.4, you're gonna wanna go and leverage yourself with margin accounts and keep doing that, thinking, oh, I'm amazing, I can do this over and over again. So I always say that it's, you beware of that 10% rule, because most people can handle 10% fluctuations without too much of emotion. They can handle that. When it starts getting higher than that, they're vulnerable. So it's wise to take a portion that's on the table and have, make sure you have enough liquidity to handle volatilities to mitigate that. And you'll trade wiser. You won't be emotion. You'll be more strategic. And I always say have a, have a cushion account. And then make sure you have stair-stepped investments that have different degrees of volatility. And make sure you're hedging against uh, those volatilities by doing different markets. That way if one goes up and the other one goes down, you can play against the hedging process. So I think it's wise to, to, to have a little bit of diversity and be cautious myself. I'm, I'm more uh, conservative than some. Maybe when you're in your 20s, you might want to just take it all and gamble it. But I, I'm a believer that it's wise to just be methodical, have enough liquidity, and uh, don't be foolish with extremes. It seems that that incorporation of leverage is like an amplifier to your emotionality and if you don't have it under control you lose the emotions and as you mentioned as Warren Buffett says if, if you lose your emotions you have you've lost the right to manage money in essence. Yeah I, I, I met with a guy that was doing contract for differences and he was doing very extreme um, highly leveraged uh, things and he made uh, quite a bit of money for about three months he was on a roll during a, a market that was upswinging and he thought that it was his genius and then when it uh, went into a different direction, he was really having a hard time and he just killed himself and he was beating himself up and he was just thinking, what's wrong, what am I doing? I'm sabotaging everything else. And he was, he was taking credit and take blame. There's an old proverb that I, I remember way back from the 1950s, take no credit, take no blame, just keep focused on chief aim. The name of the game is a strategy. Great. So in essence, there's a sense of humility that you must approach the market as well that's coming through there. Not humility that you depreciate, but that you just are. You aren't just putting yourself down nor elevating yourself in any way. Yeah, the second you elevate yourself and get proud of yourself, you'll attract an event, hubris. Uh, anytime you go above equilibrium, nature tends to bring you back down. Anytime you go below, it tends to bring you up. But if you can stabilize yourself, I always say that if you don't govern yourself from within, you get governed from the market yeah. to teach you that. That's fabulous. That's a fabulous analogy. Excellent. Um, so, once people get further down into their trading careers, should they look to potentially manage money? Because one of the criticisms I get when I say I'm a trader and I teach trading, but particularly on the trading side, because of the recent banking crisis and all of that, some people say, um, well, traders don't make anything, they don't do anything constructive or, uh, for the economy, in essence, and they approach the, the element of our justification or reason for existence, in essence. And one of the key things you say is we should look to serve, and it's through serving, and the more people you serve, the greater you develop value. In, in essence, does trading have a value for those that are the skeptics about what we do? Um, and if it does, should we all seek to manage money as an eventual goal so that we can amplify the amount of people we serve and support? Well, that's a great question. I, I just addressed that in Brisbane just a couple days ago, because um, I got asked a similar question. 
there's a thing called transactions. And transaction is somebody, there's many different types of transaction, but the most fundamental transaction is somebody does a service or brings a product or some idea that somebody buys, and the person buying it wants that product, service, or idea, and the person that sells that wants the money. And so they both are getting what they want. It's sort of win-win. It's a non-zero-sum game uh, process. And, and if we don't have some of those out there, there's no economy. That, the, the economy depends on transactions of some product, service, or idea that's exchanged. And then you have um, somebody who's mediating uh, a brokerage of spies and sells. Now, to say that it's not essential in the market wouldn't be so, because what they do is they locate where somebody can buy and sell efficiently. So they're contributing to the overall buy and selling and the productivity because they're allowing people to access things they wouldn't know where to get it. They wouldn't even have access to that. So it wouldn't be easy to find. So the broker is actually getting a portion to make it accessible, to make it more efficient in the market, to make transactions. So if there was 100% uh, brokers and nobody was transacting, there'd be no market. <laughs> so the ratio of people actually uh, building in products and making services and doing ideas that are valuable, there has to be a ratio of those to stabilize an economy. Can't have everybody a trader, can't everybody doing this, because it's not efficient if you did nothing but trades, because you would not even know what's going on around the world. The broker can give you access to things you would never know about. So they both work in tandem, but you can't have either one of those ex to extreme. But the broker definitely gives people an opportunity to make trades they would never be able to make, and they wouldn't even know about, because they're not focused on that. They can't possibly focus on as much as the broker, because they're a specialist. So, and the broker obviously deserves a portion of that to make it efficient in the marketplace. So they're, they're actually doing an efficient system of making efficient trades in the world. So to say that they're not contributing would not be extreme, but at the same time, if there was nothing but brokers and there was nobody doing anything, you wouldn't have a broker. You need both. So in essence, a retail trader, someone trading from home, like our audience, they are almost worker bees in a price discovery mechanism for many critical things like oil that people have to buy and uh, have to know what the rate is for on any given. So it is kind of, uh, there is a, a, a community service in that sense. Yes. It, like I said, the, the key though is that the economy itself depends on an actual product, service, or idea that we need. Yeah. But we couldn't possibly do that efficiently without a, a global market. And the, the broker, that's their role and the contribution that they make. So I wouldn't say go as far as saying that they don't make a contribution. I wouldn't say that they're the, the key to all economy. I would say that everybody has a place. We all have a place and we need to put that into proper perspective. If we exaggerate or minimize it, we're eventually taught back who we really are. Trading is one of those classic um, elements where it has a very hockey stick orientated career path. Almost the beginner, the most important thing is literally just staying in the game and not destroying yourself and having quite low expectations and becoming one of the old traders because as this, uh, you kind of touched on this already, this, you get bold traders and old traders but you don't get old bold traders. Um, you have to stay in the game. How, how would you best counsel someone who's early doors in his career about ma managing those expectations and appreciating that fact because it is a it's concept of patience it's a lot of things but how do we keep him in the game for the hockey stick at the end well i think it's wise to ask yourself what worked and what didn't work every day so you hone yourself in and keep refining and mastering your skill i think it's wise to have mentorship and people who have done it for a long period of time to not have to reinvent the wheel because foresight's better than hindsight there's a thing called telenomics where you learn from hindsight like an animal uh, trial and error and there's foresight where you can learn from mentorship there's the two different trajectories are vastly different it's also wise to make sure that you ask yourself can you really truly handle that if you get emotion it's beyond your capacity to handle that's the that's the sign if you're highly emotional and you're reacting you stepped outside your your comfort zone so look honestly videotape yourself throughout the day Literally, watch yourself on the day and look at how you're responding to what's happening in the market. And if you're highly volatile, you're outside your comfort zone. And if you're not having any reaction, you probably can push the comfort zone. So use as a feedback to know what you can handle. My experience is, years ago when I was involved in financial planning, I, I, uh, I, we used to do these little questionnaires. I think it was mainly for the financial house more so than the, the customer, but we, to, to cover our, our butts, you might say. But, but it was basically a, a questionnaire to find out risk tolerance. And when the market was up, I noticed everybody was, had a high, strong risk tolerance. When the market was down, everybody was cautious. And I thought, this is not the variable. It's, it can't be what the market sentiment's doing that's determining these people's uh, risk tolerance. The key is what they actually have their assets in. 
And so I looked and then constructed and looked at how they had their, their assets allocated to determine what their real true risk tolerance was. And I found out if they had some liquidity and they had some base of conservative investments and they worked their way up that ladder of investment, of volatility and, and risk, they, um, they were able to handle the next tier. But somebody that had a, a, a liquid, but then they just jumped into high volatilities, they usually end up uh, biting and, f and getting volatile. So I always say that you earn the right to risk, you take it methodically, you do it in steps, and um, you let piggy banks become piggy banks, and you build what is called momentum. That hockey stick is a result of momentum. It's a logarithmic curve. If you just make incremental uh, games, the amount that you get to play in gets to be bigger. And as you do, it starts to make bigger percentages. And if you just methodically stay with it, you can actually do great great returns. I mean, if you made a, a three to six percent return every single month and just kept doing three to six percent and just kept doing little bitty incremental things every single month, that's enormous. <laughs> you double your money in, in, in just a few years if you keep doing that. But if you keep wanting to get a 30, 40, 50 percent return and try to double your money overnight and, and then crash and you'll probably have um, burnout, and you won't probably have meaning. You, it's wise for any trader to ask what is the purpose and the meaning, and how are they serving the economy by what they're doing? I really believe that, because people that have meaning in what they do manage their monies wisely, and they think longer term than people that don't find meaning in it, and they're just wanting immediate gratification. So sitting down and writing down, while I'm doing trade, how is that serving the world? and literally answering that question over and over again so you feel a responsibility for your role in this world so you want to master the work and not just about you and making a fortune. That's fabulous because that's going to be the foundation of your patience. It's going to be the foundation of your emotional uh, management. And I, I can't get away from the feeling, uh, having listened to your work, that this is very essential pre-game preparation and it's so important it probably isn't pre-game it is the game uh, in essence because if you get all of this properly grounded even on an average um, trading system I believe you'd probably be better off than someone with an outstanding system but without that um, emotional space. And you got to be careful about um, thinking that you've got this secret, this, this massive secret you figured out. I see this very commonly, and I'll get a, a broker will come to me and say, I've got this new thing that nobody's figured out, I've figured it out, da, 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 and they're, they're, their mind starts to grandize themselves thinking they do it, and then they're trying to force the market in to fit that. They're trying to force that market into that, into that little model that they've come up with. Um, wiser to um, stick to the basics, they've been around. We learn things as we go, and there are new things coming along, but a lot of them are the same things that we just keep having to learn again. And repackage. And I, I try to avoid guudom of other people and of self, and that tends to tie into the ego element that you're saying, and it loses your balance and symmetry as well. What, where people overput themselves forward as a guru, should people be cautious of that? Yeah, we had, um, there was a gentleman, the one I was mentioning a moment ago in, in the options pit. I was down in Chicago, and I got to go into the pit and watch him do, spend days doing this. And it was really interesting watching. There was this one guy that I was working with, and we had a, a nice system that we developed. It took us a while to put it together, but we really had a nice system that, that was allowing us to not get emotional, stick to it methodically, and he was, uh, he was getting good returns. Not huge returns, not uh, you know, something that would end up on, on the Wall Street, but just nice, consistent returns. And there's a guy in the, in the pit there that just knocked it out of the ballpark. I mean, made a fortune, took a huge risk, made a fortune, and everybody thought this guy was a genius. He spent the next three years, one, losing most of that money, and the next three years never being able to compete with that, and he was basically beating himself up because he was thinking he was supposed to do that all the time. And so what happened is all these people went flooding to him thinking he had the special gift. And they all flooded him, and then over the next three years when he didn't make any return, they all, they all got bit because they were looking for this magic thing. And this guy that we were working with, that I was working with, he just methodically just kept doing it. He outperformed him. Over the period of five years, he outperformed him just doing little bitty increments. Increments. So this big kill and then this lull, waiting for the big kill. One of the things I love that you say, and I think I'd uh, appreciate you going over, is how money finds those that value it, so tying back in the plan. What's your take on that? Because you've kind of given us a bit, a bit of a metaphor story right there. Well, I always say that money circulates to the economy from those who value it least to those who value it most. Money circulates to the economy from those who have the least order around it and discipline around it than those that have more discipline. That's where it goes. Um, they go from least discipline to most discipline. And those that have the least concern for humanity 
to the most concern for humanity, they're the ones that keep it. So in other words, if you're thinking uh, for yourself and you start to think, well, that's only about you and you're not thinking about what actually serves the market, what serves people, which is where sources of income really come from, you have to find nature tends to force you back into equanimity within yourself. Pride and shame have to be equilibrated and equity between you and the others and learning how to make sure you do something that's a win to you and a win for others. And if you lose that and start to think it's you're special over somebody else, you get humbled. I really like that and it's a question I had as well for you. As you start progressing and you're having some degree of success, how important would it be to potentially take some of that away and have a cause that you truly believe in outside of trading where you give both time and a portion of the proceeds and you tie that to uh, something outside of the trading world that you believe in. And I don't want to use the word altruism. I know your definition of uh, altruism, but I'm talking about a bit of give back. Well, the greater your cause, the greater your wealth potential. That's the bottom line. Um, what's interesting is I, I, I ask people, if you have something, I'll, I'll use three examples here. If you're doing a job and you're at a career and you're, you're doing a project that is extremely meaningful to you, that you're really inspired by, you, um, you don't think about breaks. You don't want it to stop. You don't want to go and, uh, and get away from it. You want to keep working on it. And the day goes by really quick, and you don't think about time at all. You're just into engaged in it. And uh, when you do, if you do take a break, it's quickly to get to eat to so get back to work. It's a quick essential. You eat the essentials to eat wisely. You don't want to eat uh, foolishly. You want to eat just enough and get back and keep for, well, working. But if you are basically unengaged, uninspired in your work, and you're unfulfilled, you're looking at the clock, you're kind of emotional. When you do eat, you'll want to go and eat too much. You'll want to take a longer time on break. You'll probably extend it. You'll probably take a longer break than you're allotted. Um, you'll be overeating. You'll probably have teas and coffees and sweets and consumerism and everything else to compensate for the unfulfillment you have. You have less governance over yourself and your diet and your lifestyle when you're not meaningfully doing something. Now the same thing if a, if a woman's about to get married, and this is one of the most meaningful things in her life, she will regulate her diet and she will get into that perfect shape to get into that uh, wedding outfit. Because she's got a long-term goal and then I'm going to get in there and within three, four weeks from now I'm going to be in perfect shape. When we have a purpose and we have something that's inspiring to us, that's meaningful to us, our executive center comes online because it's the highest on our values. And that's when we have the most governance, the most patience, the, the, the space and time horizons expand in our thinking. We have a broad mindedness. We have a, a objective a viewpoint. This is where we get the most results. This is where we're in the zone. We're in, on target and tune with, with the mastery. And I would say that when you're living by your highest values and you're filling day with high priority things, you go towards mastery. And when you don't, you go towards victim of history. You become a victim of the markets on the outside. You blame things on the outside. Look for s magic bullets on the outside. So it's so important to have something that's so meaningful and a cause bigger than your life. Something that you want to do that's beyond your own life. We go around in theology saying we're immortal souls, but very few people set immortal goals. But I really believe that those that set immortal goals and they're real visionaries, they're the ones that are the most stable and they're the ones that accomplish the most. And we think of people like Elon Musk, we think of, of someone like Richard Branson that's going out there in, in astronomical visions and they're getting enormous things done. So I always say give yourself permission to do something extraordinary be within your life and beyond your life for the sake of building your wealth for things that you want to take command over that makes a difference in the world. If you do, you'll be self-governed because you want to do it for that cause. If you have a cause that's just you, you're not going to go as far as if it's big as family. You'll even go farther if it's a big for the community. You'll even go farther if it's something for the state or the nation or the world. So the bigger the vision, the more stable you are and the more you'll stay focused on it to get it because you've got more accountability. And if you don't give yourself accountable, you end up uh, not being the master of you, what, what you want. But by giving yourself accountability and bigger accountabilities, you become more, more powerful. That's incredible. So it's almost, I, I've mentioned before that going on the trading uh, program is, is like a personal development because you don't come out the same the other side if you're, if you're to be uh, successful. And in, I think in essence what you've tied in there is not only longevity, happiness, health, 
overall performance generally, feeling of well-being. If you are tired uh, sufficient, if you align correctly, um, you have real reasons for wanting to achieve that which you uh, are, are doing. Trading can actually just be the mechanism whereby that's attained. It doesn't matter. Some people, as you said, or Richard Branson are massive entrepreneurs, um, but you will actually manifest to a far higher level and it must transcend that which is just self-serving in yourself. Um, is, is that a fair sort of synopsis? You, you summarized it perfectly. Um, the greater your cause, the greater your wealth potential. That's really that simple. And the, the greater your cause, the higher the probability of you self-governing. And the greater the cause, the greater the space and time horizons that you hold. Therefore, more patience and more wisdom. And um, yeah, the, the, the immediate gratification costs wealth, but long-term vision pays. That's fabulous. I really would like to close on that incredibly high energy uh, answer. Thank you so much for that. John, in respect to you, you're in London at the moment. Um, what can we tell our audience? How, first of all, do they engage with you and to get some of that magic that you've shared with us today? How do they do that? Well, the simplest way to get a hold of me is simply through my website, drdmartini.com. Just drdmartini.com. And, um, you know, on, the, on my website, I try to, I'm an educator. So I, anything to do with mastering life and, and uh, you know, mastering and leadership in any area of your life. We, we attempt to help people in their mind development so they can master their mind and self-governance and help them in their career, help them in their wealth building, help them stabilize relationships because believe it or not, part of wealth can be completely eroded by one relationship, <laughs> destruction. Um, socially, because if you don't interact with people and care about people, you don't have the teams working for you and you need that as far as wealth building. And your health, because people that are extremely volatile like that, they can run down their health really quick. So all areas of life really ideally need to be mastered. And just like you said, if you're committed to be a master broker, you want to master your life. Because if you master your life, you'll end up being more of a master broker. They all work together. So my website's designed for that. And all my programs, the Breakthrough Experience, all my programs are designed to help people in that endeavor, to, to help them master life. That's since I was 18. I'm 61 now. Since I was 18, that's what I've wanted to do. I've wanted to help master my own life and help other people do the same. Fabulous. Um, I can say that having been on the Demartini Method, I found immense value in it, and uh, thank you very much for that. Thank you for appearing with us on uh, today, and I hope you have a very successful trip. Thank you.